Well, welcome to the final night of the Didsbury Lectures. And my name is Deirdre brower -Latz. I'm the principal of Nazarene Theological College. And it's lovely to see all of you here in the room. Thank you for joining us so faithfully. And also those of you who are joining us on Facebook, it's a wonderful opportunity we have to live stream the lectures in this way. And thank you so much for your engagement. It's a joy and an honor for me to introduce our lecturer for the final time. So it's been an absolute delight to have you amongst us, Professor Berkeley. Your lectures have challenged us, they've shaped and connected with us in various ways. They've enabled us to think deeply about our faith and our practice as Christians, as leaders. It's worked on our desire to learn the scripture more deeply, I think, and to engage in it widely. And as all these lectures do when they're at their very best, it's been truly interdisciplinary. It's taken us into places that have stretched all of us in our various fields and has chimed with many of the things that we think about. So thank you so much. You've also, of course, provoked us at points, and I hope that the questions tonight will stir you and shape your thinking as well as you engage with them. So as all of these lectures do, we end tonight, hopefully on a high, um, but it has just been an absolute joy <laughs> to get to know you. And it's my pleasure to introduce for this time, Professor John Barclay, the Lightfoot Professor of Divinity from Durham University. So welcome. Well, thank you so much, Deirdre, for your for your introduction and for the wonderful welcome I've received here at, uh, at Nazarene Theological College. It's been a privilege for me to spend time with you all here this week. I've had such um, wonderful hospitality, a fantastic Korean meal tonight, thanks to, um, thanks to me, Joey, and uh, Unho. Un so thank you for um, looking after me so well. And um, thank you for those of you who are here. If you've been here four nights in a row, then you, you deserve a, a special medal, I think, uh, uh, as, as you leave. And those of you who are joining us online, thank you for, for being with us and for the questions that you've sent. And to, today um, will be quite exploratory in some ways. I'm going off, off my kind of most familiar territory, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, interaction at the end. So the title of my lecture is, Should We Give Ourselves Away? Another Vision of the Common Good. My aim in these lectures has been to challenge what has become a default assumption in Christian thought, deeply entwined with modern Western notions of the self, of gift, and of altruism. What is assumed is that the Christian ethic, indeed what makes it distinctively Christian, is to give without return, to spend without reward, to sacrifice oneself for the other. In this frame, charity is in principle, or at least at best, unilateral and top-down, a mode of operation that fits well with central features of modern liberalism, including our passion for autonomy and self-sufficiency. What I'm arguing is that there are other ways of reading the Christian tradition, ways that may seem disappointing to those who hold to the heroic ideal of self-negation, but that have their own radicality and that contribute better to the common good. On this alternative reading, elements of sacrifice required by self-giving are placed within a larger frame, a narrative that closes not with the extinction of Jesus, but with his beneficent lordship over the world, and not with the destruction of the self, but with its reconfiguration, its enlargement, and its fulfillment in the final purposes of God. In that larger context, reciprocity, for all its complications and dangers, can be viewed as a good. The return of the gift is what expresses a relationship of mutual interdependence. And the Christian ethic is not reduced to the act of giving until spent, but includes making space for others to give, including the poor. I'm toying with the idea of calling my next book The Return of the Gift, um, which some people think would be a good and some people not a good idea. 
we've turned to Paul for resources in this matter. Paul, despite the fact that he is not famous for statements about the poor, about charity, or almsgiving. Paul was faced with the challenge of creating new communities in a culture where circles of trust were essential to survival, but where competition and mistrust were typical of everyday life. As his letters show, the creation of such communities was not easy, and we're fortunate, in fact, that he was required to spend considerable time clarifying and developing his vision for new sibling-like networks in response to multiple dysfunctions. Now, I'm not claiming that Pauline resources will be all that we need, or that we can apply Pauline texts to contemporary issues without considerable hermeneutical effort. A proper theological hermeneutic will need to be enriched by wider theological resources, and it will need, of course, to be attuned to our own contemporary complexities. But this is a time, is it not, when we badly need resources for articulating a new vision of our common life. From Robert Putnam's famous book, Bowling Alone, to John Yates's recent book, Fractured, we have plenty of analysis of our modern social fragmentation and hyper-individualism, which are the fruits of an economy and a culture that prioritizes individual autonomy. But this serves us badly, does it not? Just at a time when we need local, national, and global solidarity if we are to meet the challenges of today, rising inequality, a global, ben a global pandemic, increasing migration, and the growing catastrophe of our climate emergency. Where do we find the resources to think better and to think creatively about the common good? Theologically Catholic social teaching has offered significant resources, reactivated, of course, in recent papal encyclicals. But biblical and specifically New Testament resources are rarely deployed, except in the form of isolated, uh, isolated citations. So part of my purpose is to put Paul on the map, as it were, or on the table, we might say, and to ask what we might learn from close attention to his letters. And today I want to wrap up my efforts first by gathering some Pauline motifs from another text that we've so far only touched on, that's Galatians 5 and 6, and then by summarizing and developing our conclusions under three headings. These are explorations with an open agenda and untied ends, and your comments, your criticisms, and your suggestions are an essential component of this enterprise. So first, let's think about building communities in Galatia. Let me begin by gathering some motifs from our previous studies of Paul as they, as they cluster, as it happens, at the end of Galatians. The churches that have been founded by Paul in various cities of Galatia were probably familiar with the baptismal formula that Paul quotes in this letter, in which it said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Drawn together by their common trust in Christ, and their experience of the Spirit, across differences of ethnicity, status, and gender, these believers were encouraged by Paul to knit together new communities in a web of mutuality and reciprocal recognition. Paul's first instruction to them is that through love, they serve as slaves to one another. Truly a paradoxical injunction, slaves to one another, whereby a hierarchical relation in one direction is matched by a hierarchy in the other, as if each figure in this relationship is both superior and inferior. The alternative to this mutual love is mutual destruction. Beware lest you bite and devour one another. Because for Paul, mere tolerance of one another is not an adequate basis for community. That requires an intensity of mutual engagement that could go two ways. There's either mutual support or mutual hurt. And a lot needs to be done and said to promote the better outcome. Whereas we might say to each other, just tolerate each other, just get on, just separate, go your own ways and tolerate each other. Paul has a more 
intense notion of community, which could go very badly wrong, um, or it could go very well. This mutuality is picked up in the famous statement, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is the theme of our chapel service earlier this week. Where note, Paul assumes no one has the capacity as a self-sufficient individual to bear their own burdens on their own. In what sense this mutual support represents, as he calls it, the law of Christ? That's been much discussed by scholars. But the reference to Christ is a sign that Paul's ethics never stand alone as a set of bare principles, but are embedded, as we've seen, within a larger Christ-ordered reality. A narrative which, in which, as Paul puts it, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That love, of course, was costly, but its end result is not that Paul or anybody else should live without Christ, but with him. Since the one who gave himself is now, as Paul says, the source of his life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, while speaking of love, Paul quotes the famous command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, citing, of course, Leviticus 19. Note how that text does not allow us to play the the other off against the self. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to love another as yourself, hose set out on? Well, that's been much discussed. Does this mean in the same way as you love yourself or to the same degree? One might also read it this way. In loving your neighbor and in identifying your interests with theirs, you're loving, in a sense, also yourself. That is, your expanded self, what I've called the self-with. Because within a we... There is no in-principle competition between the self and the neighbor. Only the wider context of Paul's thought can determine, I think, how he reads this famous Leviticus text. But what's clear, at the very least, is that the self is not negated or destroyed. You can't really love your neighbor as yourself and then say, yourself doesn't matter. There's a sense in which it, it must be embedded there. If the model here is out of conjoined benefit, that would fit the instruction a few verses later that the one who's taught the word should share in all things with their teacher. I'm sure the teachers here at Nazarene Theological College often quite uh, uh, quote that. You know, those who are taught should share in all good things with their teacher. Share, koinoneo, is the verbal cognate of that potent word kon- koinonia, which I find very hard to translate. Fellowship seems too weak a translation. Partnership is better. But koinon means what's held in common, as opposed to idion, what's held, what's purely my own. And what Paul envisages is a kind of commonality, or perhaps solidarity, where the collective we encompasses and enhances the the interests of all the individual eyes that share the common good. That solidarity, let me stick with that word, is not static, but it consists in those repeated acts of benevolence implied by Paul's instruction a few verses later in the same passage about doing good. Do good to all, he says, and especially the household of faith. Configuring, as we saw last night, a cross-household network of believers as a new form of household, with sibling-like responsibilities to one another, at the same time as it opens the horizon of this household to an indeterminate all, do good to all. And this doing good is not an endless self-depletion. Let us not grow weary in doing what is good, for we will reap at the proper time if we do not give up. Like a sower who sows in hope of the harvest, indeed in line with the teleology of nature, The giving out is accompanied by and fulfilled by a getting back. The person who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. I think we should dwell on that statement and let it grate with full force against our modern ideal of a no-return altruism. Paul here encourages those liable to grow weary or give up 
those currently getting little satisfaction and perhaps no reward from their generosity and benevolence to others. That is the risk that they must take. And their goodness is not to stop just because it's humanly unrecognized and unreciprocated. And here, I think, is precisely the real challenge of the Christian ethic, which is radical, not in refusing or disparaging the return, but in its endurance of risk, in its patient continuation, even when there is no return, and its trust that eventually, in God's time and in God's way, such generosity will be taken up within God's fulfillment of all things. That trust is, if you like, the wager of Christian generosity according to the law of Christ. To sow at the risk of no return, but in the hope that both giver and recipient will share in the God-granted harvest at the proper time. Armed with this little reprise, as it were, Pauline motifs, let me now sum up and develop the themes of these lectures under three headings all of which are phrased to point beyond our current notions towards a conceptual frame that could take its bearings from Paul. So first, from charity to solidarity. Now, we live in a time of increasing inequality and rising poverty. And in the wake of a pandemic, we live after a year in which food bank use in the United Kingdom rose by 33%, with 2.5 million emergency food parcels distributed by the Trussell Trust. That, of course, was necessary, but it's easy to get stuck in a mental model of top-down, one-way charity, where those with spare resources help those without, in acts of compassion that may unwittingly instill a sense of distance, even superiority, between the giver and the receiver. Now, there are, of course, emergency situations where this is precisely what is required. But as the Trussell Trust themselves insist, this is neither a sustainable nor a desirable model in the long term. Trussell Trust would be delighted if they had no longer needed to give out any, any uh, food bank uh, gifts. A story that sticks in my memory that I used in the chapel the other day comes from a church in London that organizes a regular community meal frequented by the homeless, where one participant, a homeless man, insists on bringing each week a packet of biscuits that he takes around the table, urging everyone to take from what he has contributed. He wanted, indeed he needed, the dignity of being a giver. And if those who had supplied the meal had condescendingly refused his biscuits on the grounds that he needed them more, they would unwittingly have humiliated him. One-way giving can, paradoxically, damage the recipients. He needed to be able to respond. Paul, the community builder, offers some resources to think better about, in, about interdependence about reciprocity and esteem, where we move beyond the top-down model of philanthropy or patronage to modes of solidarity and mutual dependence, which consciously seek ways in which a power relation that operates in one direction can be tilted the opposite way in oscillating forms of asymmetry. Now, Paul, of course, was speaking to and about Christian communities united by faith in Christ. But he takes these communities, this is crucial for me, to represent the proper ordering of human relations under the righteousness or justice of God. That is, a new humanity as humans were designed to be, not a sect with its own special house rules. What he sees here enabled by Christian faith is what is good for humanity as such not a peculiar ethic relevant only to certain people. Moreover, as we've seen, the goods that circulate within these communities cover the whole gamut of human benefits, material, social, psychological, and spiritual. And since Paul considered all these goods to be given by the Creator through the agency of Christ, what is said about the reciprocal sharing of goods within the body of Christ may, I think, be extended to encompass all 
all the talents, assets, and resources shared by humanity at large as benefits of what we sometimes call common grace. The Jerusalem collection is encouraged by the observation Paul makes that he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Note how Paul moves to and fro between what we might call the natural goods of creation and the spiritual goods of the spirit and doesn't expect different pr principles to apply. So what we find in Paul is, I think, in principle, extendable to gift giving and benefit sharing in general. According to the Pauline tradition, as we find it in Colossians and Ephesians, Christ integrates the whole of the universe and is the mystery of its origin, its sustenance, and its destiny. Thus the Christ story frames all human gift reciprocity even where his framing is uh, even where his framing is presently unrecognized not only among those who already acknowledge Christ's ordering of the whole what we found in Paul are patterns of relationship that place doing to or doing for within the goal of being with to be sure, the gift is always doing for in the sense that love seeks the welfare of the other fully and completely. But the goal is the enhancement of the other for the common good, including, in some form, the good of the donor. In other words, a gift can be 100% for the other and at the same time 100% for the common good. And that is a shared good that includes the good of the giver. In the field of international relations, as you know, there's been a seismic shift away from aid as doing for the other in donations that often left the recipient communities dependent, even inhibited in their growth, towards models of development where the goal is the enhancement of multiple capabilities at the local level, to use the language of, of um, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. The assumption is that everyone has the potential that needs freedom and opportunity to be realized. If the vision is directed by an understanding of interdependence, the goal is not that everyone should be independent and self-sufficient, but that all should be empowered to contribute to the common good, locally, nationally, and internationally, both in economic and in other social respects. The reason for the success, for instance, of microloans is that they enable forms of solidarity, accountability, and reciprocal support that move beyond the dependencies created by charity. They empower women, in particular, to realize their social capital and their talents in ways that benefit everyone. The same principles apply to what is known in this country is asset-based community development. Well, not only here, in America as well. A mode of thinking, asset-based community development, ABCD, a mode of thinking that resists the tendency for external agents to ride in to a so-called deprived community. Note how even that label says something about we expect just deficit to ride into a so-called deprived community without regard to its own priorities, its own assets, and its own agency. What is required and what is basic to the principles of asset-based community development is the expectation that the community itself will already contain multiple gifts, skills, resources, and capabilities, which can be discovered and developed to build local capacity local leadership and local initiative. So on these principles, outside resources, personal or, or, or financial, should be deployed only in such a way as to develop and enhance the gifts already present within the community, certainly not to supplant them or to diminish them. From my own experience on the ground in a northeast former mining community, all that rings true. <laughs> 
and is vitally important if we're to move beyond the social depression that is the legacy of deindustrialization. The eye, as Paul would say, cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. If the pandemic has helped us rediscover our interdependence, it's also made salient again, I think, Paul's vision of community, where no part of the body can flourish unless all flourish together. The theological vision articulated in Sam Wells' book, um, Nazareth Manifesto, is that God is for us in order to be with us. And we've seen that expressed in the Philippians narrative about Christ. Christ with us down to the depths of human degradation and death in order that we might be with him in his reordering of the cosmos. Being for the other in order to be with the other is the pattern of Pauline social relations. And it's a Christian vision that resists the distancing effects of patronizing forms of charity. And we've noticed the importance of Paul of dignity or honor that everyone has the esteem of recognition and is empowered to give. As multiple studies of poverty have recognized, one of the most debilitating features of poverty is the social and psychological sense of disempowerment and the loss of self-esteem. As Michael Sandel highlighted in his recent book, The Tyranny of Merit, one effect of our modern Western meritocracy is the assumption that we have adopted that those who, who succeed deserve to succeed, while those who do not, or are lower down the economic ladder, somehow have deserved to do less well, have failed in the contest of life, and are accordingly due lesser respect. Food banks are often places of shame. They may be a necessary stopgap, but our larger social goal is that everyone should have the capacity to share food with others. In other words, the Christian goal, as I've said elsewhere, is not the food bank, but the potluck supper, the common table or the feast to which everyone can contribute at some time and in some way. As Mark Sampson has argued recently, I think there are theological resources here for supporting, for instance, social enterprises. There's a theolo deep theological rationale for social enterprises, not as aberrant forms of business, but as the expression of a business ethic whose purpose is the inclusion of all in economic and social well-being. Solidarity is a useful label for this vision, although I know it requires nuance. The New Testament pictures, as we've seen, varied. Uh, sorry, uh, the New Testament pictures varied forms of, of solidarity, not all of which entail complete or even partial pooling of resources. As we've seen for Paul, the shared meal, the Lord's Supper, is a kind of hypercharged symbol of communal responsibility to one another, which signals a readiness to help each other when the need arises but not necessarily the establishment of a common fund. But any form of, of, so, of solidarity will challenge our passion for autonomy, independence, and individual choice. I guess our huge global challenges, economic and environmental, are forcing us to acknowledge that individualism and competition need to be moderated, powerfully moderated, by structures of, of collaboration and interdependence and solidarity. And I think Paul can help us articulate that alternative vision, providing us with language and with critical tools that are sorely needed. So my second heading is from selfless to self-with. You'll be familiar with this language now. As we've seen, the model imprinted on our modern minds is that of a form of altruism defined by a kind of irresolvable antithesis between the self and the other. It's common to imagine our alternatives as a, kind, as a spectrum, running from, at one end, a pole we label selflessness or disinterest or altruism, to its opposite pole, which we label selfishness, self-interest, or egoism. Citizens UK, 
which is the community organize, which, uh, as you know, is a community organizing movement, has used this spectrum in its training for organizations, including faith groups, whom they mobilize in local campaigns. After depicting this spectrum with its opposite poles, Citizens UK positions itself in the middle. It wants organizations to envisage themselves as working for mutual benefit, developing partnerships from which everyone will gain. And some churches I know faced with this spectrum react negatively to the proposal of the middle way. Their instinctive Christian desire is to be at the selfless end of the spectrum. They do not want to slide at all towards self-interest or egoism. Positioned on this spectrum, collaboration for mutual benefit seems like a compromise, necessary for pragmatic reasons, but morally dubious. Perhaps the most ambitious goal of these lectures is to challenge this widely held model of the spectrum and to argue that reciprocity and mutual benefit properly conducted is its own good, not a compromise position between altruism and egoism. To put it succinctly, what I'm arguing is that the proper opposite to being selfish is not to be selfless, but to be self-with. To be sure, in the process of being self-with, there will be certain things to be sacrificed, foregone, even negated. But it's both incorrect and, I think, deeply unhelpful to figure this self-with stance as a kind of self-effacement, as if the flourishing of the self was somehow morally suspect or defective. If the goal is to flourish together, we need to be able to position the self in ways that are not exclusive of the other. What's sacrificed in this model of self-with is not the self as such, but the self apart, or the self against, the self that seeks benefit to itself at cost to others. Now, such self-centeredness is, of course, a default feature of our, com of our human nature, a part of what the Christian tradition means by sin. That is what Paul instructs against, the tendency to seek our own benefit to the detriment of others. Love, as he says, does not seek its own way, in the sense that it does not work for the benefit of the self against, or the benefit of the self apart. That raises proper suspicion against acts and demeanors that have the appearance of, benefit, the appearance of benefiting others, but are actually designed to benefit ourselves without benefit to others. So built into the Christian ethic is vigilance against pseudo-beneficence, the tendency to manipulate others or to use them for our own separate good. But this should not be confused with self-denial in the sense of self-negation. To echo Logan, um, Logan Williams again, the Christian ethic is to give oneself into a relationship with others, not to give oneself away. Paul makes himself, he says, a slave to all people, to the Jews, a Jew, to non-Jews, as one without the law, which sounds like self-negation. But he does this, he says, so that he might be a co-sharer, sunkoinonos, in the good news. Combining that characteristic preposition, sun, with, and the noun koinonos, partner or sharer. When he made himself a slave to others, he renounced certain rights, as he puts it, and he denied himself certain options. But he did not negate himself, since the goal is that he should share with others in the fulfillment affected by the good news of Christ. His self here is redefined, but not destroyed. He's against self-interest, if that means competitive gain at the expense of others, but if the self is configured as a self that flourishes with others, this expanded self will certainly have its interests fulfilled. In this configuration of things, there's a place for sacrifice and self-denial so long as it is located within a larger frame that ultimately expects the, uh, sorry, a larger frame that fulfills the purpose of the self. 
There is a strong pull, of course, in the Christian tradition towards sacrifice, shaped by the story of Christ who humbled himself all the way to death. No one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Love requires a vigorous opposition to the tendencies of the self apart or the self against. And as we, as we have seen, it undertakes the risk that it may not be reciprocated in receiving a human return. For that calling and in that risk, it may go all the way to death as the acme, the extreme of its sacrifice. But the extreme is not the goal. To use two Greek words, the acme is not the telos. If the purpose is friendship, the death of a friend is in one sense the defeat of that purpose, not its ultimate expression. And for this reason, Aristotle and other ancient philosophers who had a strong sense of shared benefit in friendship, they put a limit on self-sacrifice and insisted that friends would never harm themselves in trying to benefit the other. In the Christian tradition, the risk is faced, that risk is faced and even willingly undertaken, such that the common good may involve death, but only in extreme cases and only within a wider vision that God will locate and overcome that sacrifice within God's life-giving purpose. Christ gave himself to death in obedience and love, but the story does not end on the cross. His obedience is the trust that God's self-giving love will ultimately lead to the reordering of all things. If Paul is willing to give his life for his churches, it's because he's confident that his name, like theirs, is written in what he calls the book of life. And that, as he puts it, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Death for the believer may be the acme of love. The furthest extent to which love can go, if that's the only way that the good can be affected. But one's life is given in faith or trust that God's purposes are stronger than death. The telos, in other words, even in death, is not the, extin the extinction of the self, but the enclosure of the self within an eschatological we, that is, life with God, with others, and with the renewed creation. So the radical character of self-giving in this tradition is not the refusal of the return, but the risk that a human return may never be realized. The purpose of this risk is not to display a human virtue of self-sacrifice. The purpose is to enable the good to be extended everywhere, even where the chances of a return fade to vanishing point. Do good to all, says Paul. Bless those who persecute you. Sustain your enemies with food and drink. Overcome evil with good, even if there's no guarantee, in fact, very little chance, that the good will be reciprocated. For the same reason, Jesus commands giving beyond the circles of assured reciprocity. Love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Not because a return would diminish or defeat the good, but so that the good is unlimited in its reach, not confined by the guarantee of a return. The Good Samaritan rescues the helpless stranger who has been stripped of his clothing. And the, re and the, uh, the result of, of being stripped of his clothing is that it gives no clue as to his status or wealth. Taking him to the inn and paying for his medicine and his accommodation, the Good Samaritan has no guarantee he'll ever be repaid. That's the risk that love requires. But it does not mean that a repayment would be unwelcome or refused. At another level and in another form, as we've seen, it's positively expected. When you give to enemies, says Jesus, your reward will be great. And when you extend your invitation to those who cannot repay, you will be blessed, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Such promises are an embarrassment to those who think that Christian self-giving requires the refusal of a return, but they're entirely understandable. If the perfection of self-giving is not non-reciprocity, but the, if the perfection is the extension of the gift, 
without regard to worth or to capacity, including the capacity to return, an extension that entails a risk of no return. But as is indicated by the gospel images of the feast, the telos is that everyone should be at the table, including the self-giving self. So finally, from unilateral altruism to shared flourishing. The vision I've just sketched moves us away from one-way philanthropy to a goal of co-benefit and shared fulfillment. There may be moments or elements of one-way giving within this frame, such as emergency relief or anonymous gifts. But they are only necessary stopgaps or temporary extremes rather than self-standing ideals or goals. As we've seen, Paul's theology, like the rest of the New Testament, presumes an eschatological horizon in which the contextual necessity or the calculated risk of no return is embedded within a larger frame, a bigger narrative, in which God will bring God's good purposes to fulfillment for both donor and recipient. Let's not grow weary in doing the good, for in due time we will reap. Now, it's important how we figure this horizon theologically. A crude reading of New Testament metaphors of harvests or crowns or rewards could generate visions of extrinsic extrinsic or individualistic rewards, which would pull us back, I think, into the self apart or the self against. If I do this for you so that I may gain that for me, and if that me is figured as the buffered self, the self apart from you, we've returned to the model of the self versus the other, my gain pitted against yours. But it's not necessary to read the New Testament this way. If God loves a cheerful giver, as Paul puts it, it's because the cheerful giver is enveloped in the momentum of the self-giving love of God, fulfilled not by acquiring an extrinsic benefit, but in the giving itself. Luke describes those who love their enemies as children of God, not just in the sense that they imitate the mercy of God, but because they have been integrated into the ethos of the self-giving God, whose reward is this proximity to the source of true life. Now, as we noted in the first lecture, it was partly in reaction to an over-literal reading of New Testament eschatology that criticisms of the Christian tradition arose in the 18th and 19th centuries, where giving with the hope of reward was characterized and caricatured as a, as a form of egoism or self-interest. As I've just argued, this eschatological hope can be better interpreted theologically as a form of intrinsic, intrinsic reward. But what you might ask would this mean or could this mean for those who have no such eschatological hope? One can imagine, I think, three possible answers. First, this loss of an eschatological hope of reward could justify returning to more calculated and risk-free forms of giving. Giving that is relatively sure of a humanly realizable return and thus inevitably more limited giving. Secondly, the removal of the eschatological horizon could result in idealizing the non-return gift. If one preserves the ethos of self-giving but removes the hope of ultimate fulfillment, one is left only with giving, giving, and giving again in a kind of heroic self-annihilation such that self-sacrifice becomes an end in itself. That, of course, is what Nietzsche thought Christianity was about and despised, but what others, and I think mistakenly, have taken to be the glory of the Christian ethic. Or, as a third option, one could adapt the notion of an intrinsic reward, removing it from its narrative eschatological location, and one could situate it psychologically in the inner satisfaction and internal pleasure of knowing that a kindness has been done and a benefit has been conferred. As we've seen, for some purists like Derrida, even that is a kind of contradiction of the gift, 
But most of us can accept that as a form of internal, if you like, this worldly reward. That sense of ultimate worthwhileness, even if it's ultimate in a non-eschatological sense, is perhaps where many people come to rest. At least those who, who, uh, who, who, who inhabit a non-theistic belief framework. Christian belief would, I think, claim that whatever psychological satisfaction we may receive from doing good to others is a shadow of the solid joys and lasting pleasures intended by God for all of creation under the Lordship of Christ. If, as I'm arguing, the notion of divine reciprocity or reward is not theologically improper, if it is not, as Protestants have falsely suggested, a kind of Jewish leftover or a Catholic error, then there's nothing in principle faulty with the pattern of gift and return. In fact, as we've seen, Paul assumes throughout the gifts are fulfilled in their receipt and their return, and that the healthiest relationships are not unilateral interactions, but are constituted by reciprocity, mutuality, and interdependence. That's not to say that reciprocity is always in all circumstances right. It carries dangers and is prone to distortions that Paul was aware of and that Western culture has specialized in highlighting. But there are many ways in which reciprocity can be well conducted, can be diffused, for instance, where bilateral quid pro quo seems inappropriate or dangerous. Just as there are multiple ways in which imbalances of power in a gift relationship can be corrected or altered. If our default reaction to reciprocity is only critique or fear, we may inhibit the creation of richer relationships in which the goal is mutual flourishing, where others are not passive partners of our benevolence, but gifted partners with whom we are pleased, from whom we are pleased to receive. It seems that God has designed us to flourish with one another and not apart. And reciprocity is one means to that end. So let me wrap up. My title, Beyond Charity, was designed to provoke, as you said at the beginning. But provocation is not an end in itself. In one sense, I am not, of course, against charity. If by charity we mean giving, generosity, even the sacrifice of certain aspects of the self. At the heart of the Christian message is the giving of God and the self-giving of Christ, who did not seek his own private good, but bore the burdens, the sins, and the curse of others, descending all the way to death. But God's self-giving in Christ is not ultimately self-annihilation, and nor is our own. I do not want to remove the cross from its centrality in the Christian story, far from it. But if the cross is not located within its wider theological and eschatological frame, it can be used to justify harmful forms of giving. Feminist critiques of Christian self-sacrifice and of Christian idealizations of suffering are an important corrective. While the harmful effects of charity on recipients are widely known. The answer is not to give less, but to give better. And I've tried to unearth Pauline resources that can help us re-articulate notions of collaboration, mutual dependence, and conjoint benefit as the proper ends of the gift. I'm fully conscious that Paul doesn't give us all that we need, and we can hardly expect him to provide a template for our social problems in a very different time and circumstance. But perhaps the benefit of Paul is precisely that he's not a modern thinker and thus not bound by the constraints of our modern mental constructs. If he offers us an alternative vision and different language to think through our human possibilities, that is a gift in itself. At a time when we need modes of collaboration and solidarity across the globe, around our nation, and in our local communities, but we seem to lack the means to speak well about this, or even to imagine it as our goal, Paul may prove to be a surprising source of help. Of course, he offers theological resources for this task of reimagination, but we should not, I think, apologize for that, since theology has a vital role to play in our search for the common good. 
There are ways in which, as uh, we've seen, aspects of Paul's vision can be employed outside of his theological assumptions, but for Paul at least, an ethic without a theology is an ethic always liable to distortion. What Paul offers is a way of thinking and practicing gift beyond our ingrained habits of top-down charity, and that's a resource we need to develop, expand, adapt, and apply to our contemporary problems. And here I will close, but with one condition. If I offer these lectures in the proper spirit of the gift, it's because I hope very much to receive from you, from your questions, your criticisms, your suggestions, and reflections. I've already gained much in that over the last few nights and in many conversations um, with, with various people here. And I look forward to it again tonight from you as gifted partners in a common task. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Sorry, I thank you. As the applause showed, a most welcome lecture. And we have time for questions. And so I'm opening up to the floor and also to those online. I think Siobhan has graciously agreed to curate those for us. So Dr. Noble, if you would again, if you're in this space, come to the microphone, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much for a challenging lecture again. And uh, I think I'm about 90% with you. <laughs> That's something. That's something, yeah. <laughs> and uh, certainly I accept all the positive things uh, you say about self-withness. Right. Um, I wonder, however, if there is more to be said for selflessness. In other words, if it uh -huh. is not so much a contrast, an either-or, as right. a both-and. And, and uh, the story that came to my mind is the story of Maximilian Kolbe, who um, owned up to a crime in the... Um, concentration camp, which he'd not committed in order that uh, some of right. his uh, fellows might... might uh, Can I just... Sorry, yes, sure. Karen, is this coming through on the mic? On, on? It is, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go, sorry, please go. And uh, so I could put the question this way. Was the sacrifice of Maximilian Kolbe more noble than the sacrifice of Christ? Right. Now, the first night someone did bring up the question of the atonement, right. and certainly as we think of Christ qua God, mm. sharing in God's intention mm. that through mm. the sacrifice should come the new creation, redemption. Yeah. If we think of Christ qua man, mm -hmm. and we are not Apollinarians, right. and so he has a fully human mind and will, yeah. and goes to the cross, not, therefore, with a Cartesian certainty that this is going to bring about the resurrection, mm -hmm. but in faith. Yeah. Um, do we not have a, a picture of selflessness there, uh, which is not to be discounted? So I, I'm not saying mm. it's, I, I'm trying, it's not an either or, but right. I'm wondering if there's right. a more positive role for selflessness than right. simply risk. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my I mean, one response would be all of this language requires that we scrutinize very carefully what we mean by the self. You know, if it's selfless, in what sense selfless? What self is it less of, as it were? <laughs> and, and that's why I've sort of played, as you heard tonight, we're talking about, well, what sacrifice is the self apart or the self against or the self over? Um, what worries me about the word selfless is it seems a comprehensive you know, denial of self, um, which um, uh, seems to me to go you know, against some of the, well, the, seems to me going fully against the kind of biblical material, which is lose your life, you will save it, if you see what I mean. Uh, so the self is lost, but not lost. Um, in relation to Christ's self-giving, I think what you're absolutely right that it, it's it's a it's a giving in trust, and that and that is you know think of of Gethsemane, um, 
uh, it's picked up, I think, in Paul's language of obedience. Christ was obedient unto death. That's to say, the trust that not my will but yours be done because your will is a good will. Yeah? Not because I'm, I'm expendable and, and only you matter, but because your will is a good will. Uh, and the acme is where well, the, the peak of that is, is absolutely the risk that death will be death and nothing and nothing more. Um, the, the trust is that that isn't the end. Um, and that God's purposes go beyond death. Um, and I think, I think that, is, that, that is ultimately you know, where we end up, I think, in a, in, in a Christian ethic. That's, you know, that's why Christians you know, have often been willing to sacrifice their, their lives from the martyrs you know, onwards. Um, not because my life doesn't matter, uh, but because my life is here committed into the hands of God whose purposes will succeed. And that's a massive wager. I mean, you know, that's, of course, that's lunacy to most, you know, to the people who witnessed these martyrdoms. But it was, it was a very powerful counter-statement that God is the God of life, greater than the death that I'm just going into. And that's, I think, without that sense, it does just look like, you know, self-immolation, like, like, like self-destruction. And, of course, that's what the early Christians were accused of. You know, they're just balmy. They just throw, throw themselves in, in, into death. But the story that they were enacting was, this is necessary in the circumstance to bear witness to Christ. It's the acme of our faithfulness to Christ. But it's not the telos in the sense that this is not what it's ultimately for. And I, I'm just trying to sort of tease those things out a bit with you, but thank you for pushing me on that. That's really helpful. Okay, so this is from uh, Laura Hunt, who is picking up something that you said earlier on. Uh, she says, I've been wondering if Prof. Barclay might say something about churches that give with the goal of evangelism, which on the one hand might be seen as a way of inviting those helped in community, but which also sometimes becomes quite manipulative. Yeah, yeah. Um, this used to be called in some places. I mean, there was a, there, there was a fa there used to be a famous phrase about rice rice Christians. Do you remember that? A sort of uh, the, the, the the the. They didn't quite catch the question. Oh, sorry, the question. Sorry, could you right. So the the. Which on yeah. the one hand might be seen as a way of inviting those helped into community, but which also sometimes becomes quite manipulative. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we have to say all gifts are potentially manipulative. Mm. I mean, every gift has that danger with it. And you know, some, I don't want to sort of idealize gifts as if gifts are always wonderful. They can be. They're always complicated, and, and the power dynamics in them are, are very, are very uh, have to be watched. And I think that's interesting to me that Paul watched those. Um, so yes, it can be a form of, of manipulation. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but it can also be a way of inviting people to recognize the true source of all gifts. In, in other words, this is why I, I don't see a kind of in principle opposition between social welfare and, and evangelism. I mean, I just don't, that dichotomy seems to me really unnecessary as, as well as unhelpful because in um, in in uh, helping people reach their potential we're also drawing them to the God who in whom they will flourish most they may not recognize that their gifts come from God we're helping people recognize where their gifts come from and we're helping draw them into an economy of giving and interdependence in which they will flourish as well as we will flourish and, and which will be an expression of the goodness of God. So um, I, I don't think you know, um, evangelism and gift giving need be pulled apart. Um, I can absolutely see how they can, um, um, uh, how uh, gifts can be manipulative. If you're inviting people to join your community, um, and you say, uh, you know, you could say, oh, well, that's very self-interested. We just want people to join us. But we surely, you know, again, I want to get out of this us versus them. We want 
of course we want our community to flourish because our community is part of the larger community and our community is, 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 uh, is, is how we flourish together. So um, uh, there's nothing wrong with inviting people to join a community if you think a community is a healthy community. Uh, um, and if you benefit from that, fine, because you're all benefiting from a shared good and not an individualized good. It's not our, f we will flourish and they and other people will not. It's that we flourish together. So, um, as I say, you might say evangelism is a way of, of saying, hey, by the way, do you know where your gifts come from? Uh, and recognizing the true source and then orienting ourselves and one another into that momentum of God's love. This might be a little bit of an unfair question because going beyond the scope of your focus Fine. on Paul, but um, just thinking about the whole scope of church history, yeah. do you have examples that come to mind of Christians, of movements that have got the self with right, right. that you would right. you know, want to, to point to? Um. Well, I was talking to Deirdre earlier today about, about the, the role of Christian mission in New Zealand, um, which um, had certainly had elements of it that were you know, classic colonial uh, uh, elements, but also had a very interesting momentum from quite early, or certainly in, in, the, in the 19th century, of um, valuing and supporting and uh, enhancing, if you like, um, Maori culture, uh, in, in, and in which the gifts of Maori culture, which include actually a, you know, a, a very good counter to this Western notion of, of, of individual autonomy, how those gifts could then be brought into and were brought into the, into the, into the Christian community and, and hugely benefited the Pākehā, the white you know, the, the, um, uh, Christians who, who lived in New Zealand. Now, that relationship is never simple. And you know, the Anglican Church, for instance, has, has grappled with ways of making that work. But the general sense was there are gifts to give one another here. And Māori Christians and Māori culture has a huge amount in it that corrects the Western distortions of, of Christianity. Um, every, it then becomes really important how the power dynamics work. Uh, um, uh, but I, I, I just cite that as, 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 as one example of where, of where Christian individual Christians, Christian communities, the whole Christian tradition has benefited massively out of um, drawing out the assets the skills, the capabilities, the cultural insights of 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 Maori culture in, the, in that case. Yeah. Uh, so this is from uh, Mirche Tanchev, who says, "Would it not be better to translate koinonia with partaking rather than solidarity?" And he's thinking of examples from Galatians two nine to ten, where Paul is recognised as a fellow labourer or co-worker in yeah. union with the gospel of Christ. Yeah, um, yeah. I just think there's. Uh, I mean, it has an element of partaking. Certainly, um, one of our problems is it's just the, the the difficulty in the English language. You're finding a noun and a verb uh, that 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 can do the job. Um, uh, we don't often refer to one another as, as oh, hey, you're my partaker, because we, we'd have to define, well, partaker in what? <laughs> uh, we, we, we'd need some other, some other noun to kind of complete that, that phrase. And so certainly, when Paul talks about the Philippians, you and I, sung, koin, sung koinonoi in the grace of God. I'd say, well, maybe common, in common partakers of the grace of God. That, that might be a good way of putting it. Um, I, 
so, so, so thank you for that, for that suggestion. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm struggling to find a term that, that does all the jobs that, koino, that the koinos uh, uh, root does in, in Greek, because we find ourselves having to use a variety of different terms, and we don't get, therefore, the full, the, the, the full value of that, of that Greek term. Um, fellowship is not, is not strong enough, is it? You know, fellowship is just too, too kind of looser term. Do you have a better term, Kent? Participation. Participation, yes. Yeah, participation helps, yeah. Uh, so when Paul, t- yeah. Again, that, that then participating in what, as it were, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the koinos really is, 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 is about commonality, isn't it? It's about having something in common. And it often in Paul has this double dimension. I have it in common with you because we both share in something else. You know, um, so some people have argued that it's you know it's 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 a term from business. It certainly is used in business for sort of um, partners in you know, in a business. Um, but in Paul, it's not just you and me in a shared enterprise, but you and me sharing in something that we're receiving from God. So it has that sort of second dimension, which is which makes it even more complicated. You know? Yeah. So this is to follow up on that discussion a bit, as well as to recall how you started your first lecture, yeah. uh, which is to reference uh, the need for sharing vaccines right. internationally for the sake of yeah. ourselves as well. Yeah. Um, and on that topic, then thinking of international aid yeah. uh, from a perspective of helping others, anticipating that perhaps we won't necessarily feel those benefits immediately, yeah. but perhaps our children or grandchildren yeah. might ultimately yeah. benefit. Yeah. Um, and, and so in that way, one thinking, is there a significant difference between international aid to those who mm. uh, we don't actually know mm. versus the, that sort of uh, communal right. you know, reciprocity? Uh, and then also, um, if there is or if there's not a difference, would that be a, an instance of expanding our sense of self yep. to a broader community yep. or uh, perhaps, a, a, I don't know if broader is the right word, uh, but a more expanded definition of koinonia? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think the same principles apply, but but on a larger scale, and, 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 and the larger the scale, the more you know, impersonal it seems to get. But, but same, you know, um, we, the Western countries will not flourish in, unless the whole world flourishes. And the whole world will not flourish unless other parts of the world flourish. You know, so there's this, there's, it seems to me we've kind of, we're reaching that recognition slowly and, you know, and painfully. Um, you know, why do we intervene in what we call a failed state? Well, because otherwise lots of people are going to leave it and then we're going to have to face the migration problems and so on. So even, for, even at that level, there's sort of sense like we want Somalia to flourish. We really do. Uh, because everybody, everybody suffers if it doesn't. Um, but, but also because we want the people of Somalia to flourish in their own country, etc. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a case of, well, we do it for them and we don't do it for us, but we do it for them as part of a shared global, global community. And I do think, you know, the environmental issues really bring this to the fore, don't they? That, 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 that we, 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 we literally sink or swim together, really. Uh, and that's where, you know, we're really struggling to find that sense of communal identity that we absolutely need each other to flourish, uh, or, or you know, we we damage each other because global warming damages everybody. Yeah, saving the planet benefits everybody. <laughs> uh, so it's not a charitable action in the narrow modern Western sense of charity to give aid to developing countries to help them deal uh, with with the, with the global crisis. We all need to benefit from that together. So you're right, it, there is a kind of, I mean, in that sense, koinonia can be expanded to that, uh, on a global scale. Um, the larger the scale, the harder it is to keep, uh, as it were, to keep a personal sense, and the harder it is to see how reciprocity works. But I think there's the same 
the same patterns work. Sean, is there another question there? Do you want to ask Okay, so this is from um, Dave Lunn, who adds the caveat that he recognises that your focus is principally on Pauline literature. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he asks, have you considered how this principle of reciprocal giving and self-with might colour one's reading of James? So specifically, how it might influence our understanding of the faith and works dynamic yeah. and enrich James's repeated repudiations of favouritism. If you're aware of other areas in James that this principle might enrich or adjust, I would be interested to hear these as well. Mm. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think just to go on the on the wealth poverty thing, you get there the absolutely classic case of how the wealth divide creates the dishonouring of the poor, don't you? That you know the the, the way you, the way the person with the gold rings you know, treats the, the 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 way the community treats the, the rich person is come sit here in his lovely chair. The way it treats the poor person is go stand over there. Um, that and and that is the the, the sort of very physical, uh, brute physical dimensions of, of poverty in, you know, in, uh, in the ancient world, expressing this hierarchy of honor. And I think it's why it's so interesting to me that you know, the New Testament texts that, that f tried in one way or another to recognize the, the honor of those who are economically um, uh, 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 impoverished, you know, whether it's Paul saying the honor of giving or whether it's, 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 it's James. But these are the people God has, has called. And that completely wipes out this sense of dishonor because God has called them. He's chosen them. That's why they matter. Uh, and, and so the social dishonoring is, 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 is cutting against the, the divine verdict. Um, yeah, the faith and works. I, I mean, the, the picture I hope I've shown you is that Paul's fine with faith and works. You know, <laughs> um, it's, it's not an either or. You know, I just we just cited. You know, uh, uh, don't grow weary in doing good. I mean, what is that if not if if not if not works? If you like. And so some of the Protestant anxieties about this, I think, have been misplaced. Um, but the reason is because, uh, well, one of the you know connections is well, faith is the trust that these works matter that they're ultimately worthwhile. Uh, I, I'm more and more attracted to the idea of translating pistis as trust rather than faith, because I think it brings out a really important dimension of that. We over-intellectualize faith. And, and James is responding to a kind of very narrow, shallow notion of faith as just believing that God exists, which is not at all what Paul means by, by pistis, which is, which is trust that God has reordered the cosmos in the Christ event and will bring it to its fulfillment as the, as the resurrection has begun uh, to show. So it's that trust, uh, not just believing this or that about Jesus, but that self-involving trust that this is the way the world has been determined by in the Christ event. And that means um, a complete transformation of life, including all those things that Paul calls good works without any... Any, any Protestant anxiety that it's somehow inappropriate to talk about those things. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, if please. I may, so three different things. One of them is a question, the other two are comments. So in the research that I'm doing with a group um, called Church Action on Poverty, the research is a project around church on the margins. And the thing that has risen to the fore in our interviews with people about their experience of church is that the most significant thing for them is belonging. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, we, as you're speaking, I'm hearing belonging popping up as a koinonia mm -hmm. kind of a language. Yeah. The second thing is agency, which you didn't use, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder about how that might align itself with some of your thinking. Yeah. And then the third thing is the use of asset that you touched mm -hmm. on, an asset-based community development, which I'm really a fan of. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes worry about the language of asset. Yeah. Um, I think anything that kind of appropriates mm -hmm. capitalist yeah. language yeah. can lend itself to problems further down the line. And I suppose that's my question is, yeah. you know, is there <clears throat> any thought that you've given to that kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. 
I suspect they chose the word asset because it began with the word A and, <laughs> and produced an, uh, uh, began with the letter A, sorry, and produced the A, B, C, D. I think you'd have to absolutely define assets in a very broad way and not, not a material way. You know, it's very often, and in my experience, it's about the networks. It's about the, his, the, the knowledge, the history. It's about um, uh, just the know-how of what works in this community and, and what doesn't, and who are the movers and shakers and who matters. And it's the, um, yeah, often, um, um, I mean, there are, there are often skills that, are un, that have gone unrecognized for decades. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we should call this, uh, change it to gift-based uh, community development. But, <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and that's really interesting what you say about belonging and about agency. I mean, I, uh, it's the sense that there's something meaningful in what, in what we do. You know, it makes a difference. And I think, actually, I think there's something really interesting about early Christianity, that it gave meaning to ordinary people's actions, which were generally regarded as insignificant on the kind of um, global, you know, on, 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 in, in, on a social scale. It was like, you know, nobody might recognize about this, but you doing good to helping out your neighbor is investing in and contributing to a divine action, which is massively significant on the world scale. Somehow, suddenly, this becomes important. <laughs> as small as it, as it may be, this, this, this act is a participation in the love of God. Uh, and, and therefore, sort of suddenly elevates the, the mundane you know, into, in, 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 into the really significant. But it invests it also with a hope, you know, that this is actually, this makes a difference. Although it may seem to be very paltry, this somehow adds to and contributes to and participates in uh, the world-changing momentum that's, that's been initiated in the Christ event. So I do think, yeah, uh, um, agency... Um, you know, I mean, some of the early Christian apologists talk, talk about you know the ordinary people, the the illiterate women and the and the the, the wool workers and so on, who um, who who do good to others, and they say, you know, this actually matters more than what than, than all the philosophers in the world who can talk about doing good, but they don't actually do it. This is Athenagoras who has this lovely comment about about you know, well, the philosophers. The philosophers talk about the good, but our ordinary people do it. <laughs> you know? And this sense of massive dignity that this actually this actually um, makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. One last question. Is there another one? Yeah. One, one last one, perhaps. Okay. So let's go with this because it's a bit more of a practical one. Okay. Um, on international aid or sharing of vaccines, should we only think about paying forward or also the past, considering things like our colonial history? Ah. Well, you know, that's a really interesting, this is a sort of reparations kind of question as well, isn't it? Um, I've only just begun to think about that, to be honest. I've been prompted into it by a friend of mine called Michael Rhodes, who's doing stuff in America on, on the reparations question there in relation to slavery. And um, um, I think what you could say is this, that the where, where Western history is actually depressed, the possibilities and the potentials, um, we really need to think about how we... How we uh, create a counter momentum, which is much, much. Um, you know, whether you label that reparations or not, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, mean, I can see the benefits of that, um, but we've kind of been blind to the fact that actually, because of the massive power differential, it's been one-way benefit. It really has been one-way benefit, and, and it's been. Um, it's it's time to think much more radically about how that can be. How that can be. Change and you know I do I'm I'm haunted by that image that Paul has of you know being slaves to one another. Yes, it's been it's been a one way you know literally slavery for a long time. How about this turns the other way around in some way, and and that sort of sense of the oscillating power dynamics. I think you know that's the last thing we want is to give up power. But actually, there's a there's a sense in which now this wheel needs to turn. Yeah, thank you.
what can I say? Thank you so much. And I think, uh, shall we uh, demonstrate our thanks here in this room, I'm sure. <laughs> emojis and emoticons and all kinds of things floating up the screen I'm imagining in gratitude online as well. Thank you so much. Next year we have another person from Durham joining us which is the Reverend Professor David Wilkinson and I did jot down his title here. It's the 24th to the 27th of October. How does God act in the world? Science, providence and miracle is his tentative title. So another stirring, stimulating, and probably provoking uh, series for us. But thank you so much for giving so graciously of yourself. I don't often want to kind of kidnap Didsbury lecturers and just keep them for masses of potlucks. <laughs> but I sort of feel that I'd love to sit down and share dinner with you to talk through more of these things. And I'm sure my colleagues and peers feel the same way. So thank you again for all of this time that you've given us and our very best wishes for the book. It'll be really interesting to read some of this fleshed out. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming so faithfully. It's been lovely to see you. And as always, there are refreshments next door for you. So thank you once again. <laughs>